If you have questions, yeah. we'll start. Bruno first, yeah. The sector size of the external flash and the ROM flash, do they need to be the same? No, uh, you have to use the biggest one for the swap okay. because... Uh, it will only use the smallest subset. Yeah, because you can actually copy... The, the, the fact that there is uh, calling uh, an erase will actually erase a whole block. So if you have an internal flash that has a sector size of 2K and an external flash that has uh, 4K, um, you have to actually uh, delete two uh, sectors uh, to, to copy the external to the internal. So you decide at that point that your uh, uh, minimal sector size is the bigger of the two. Uh, but you can also scale this because the fact is, uh, the, bigger is the, the bigger the sector is, since you're doing swap uh, operations, uh, uh, this, the, the shorter the, the lifetime of the flash is, because it has a, num an, uh, a limited number of erase and write operations you can do. Uh, so if you use a, a, a bigger swap partition, it means that the flash uh, was, uh, uh, was up much, much slower. So you can also actually use that uh, for, uh, as a choice, let's say. Yes, Peter? Do you also support hardware helps like TPM or HIVs? Um, Not directly in WolfBoot, but uh, we do have the components in WolfScript uh, and can be enabled uh, uh, like when, when uh, let's say, I don't have an example already coded with that, but it's uh, kind of trivial to get uh, <coughs> secure elements that are already supported by WolfScript uh, into a secure boot solution that's powered by, by WolfBoot. So it's possible. Yeah, it is possible because WolfScript, which is the engine, the core supports some of them. A specific TPMs, I can tell you, the, we support the Infineon one, the ST33, uh, probably the third one, for the TPM in particular. But there are a lot of secure elements that use PKCS11, I don't know. There's many different hardware there, you know. So, especially with, uh, with the partners that provide hardware uh, in advance, we were able to, to provide uh, up to up-to-dated implementation, but sometimes we have to uh, to ask for uh, for a contribution to to get that specific uh, component uh, uh, working uh, with a specific solution. Um, yeah, I heard you talk about the suit specification. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's, it's still in the draft phase. Um, we do follow the, the suit guidelines. Uh, there is already uh, a draft also <laughs> of uh, um, that's a proposal, but it's not uh, uh, it's not mandatory uh, on a way that the manifest uh, should look like. Uh, that was released later. Uh, so we started with our own implementation. So we're not. Um, specifically compatible with that extra draft, but on the draft, on the suite draft, uh, the draft suite architecture uh, 05, uh, we are uh, compliant with that. Uh, you, you first. Uh, you mentioned <coughs> in your example that you were using single precision math. But does Wolf SSL actually use floating point operations? Uh, not, not by default. Uh, like most most uh, cryptographic operations are discrete operations, yeah, yeah. so yeah, there is floating point. Uh, uh, no, there is there is a um, long integers algebra that's used there. Okay, single precision means uh, that uh, I'm sorry, I'm not really a cryptographer, so uh, it's just a fixed length instead of having a big integer that can spawn uh, different lengths. The single precision math. Uh, it's simpler to implement, but of course you can't implement all the curves. Just uh, a few ECC curves can be implemented with the SP library so far. And then the second question about those uh, secure hardware elements. Are there plans, or does it exist, uh, to connect to a SIM card or SIM chip? Sure, yeah, yeah. yeah. The SIM card themselves uh, are considered secure elements. So, so the SIM card is the probably the simplest uh, example of a secure element. Uh, uh, because it can store keys, but it can also do the operation itself. And you can interact with that? Yeah, sure. Mo most of the, um, the secure elements actually look like a SIM card. Oh, that's great. So it's, uh, 
it's kind of th there is there is a overlap uh, between the two markets. Uh, you have the question, yeah. Sorry. Uh, are there possibilities to do dry runs for updates or something? Because you said that the version number is really important, so you want to do like a test update or something, and then you want to revert it to do another test. Is that a possibility or something? Or uh, no, not really. Because uh, when you send an update, uh, it has to be a final one. Uh, it has to be like a release version already. Yeah. You don't do test in the fields, right? Uh, the, the test is in the development side where Wolfboot is probably disabled or just, you know, it's you're just doing your uh, your so development. Then you think it's like better to do it with the JTAG or something before the... Yeah, right. Because uh, if, if you're flashing something uh, with an over-the-air uh, mechanism, you're flashing something that's remote and you can't normally reach with your uh, with your JTAG. So that's already on the deploy phase. Mm. So it's, uh, it's more... Yes? Well, yeah, I would, I would uh, discourage uh, uh, sending uh, <laughs> 4 billion updates to your device. <laughs> just suppose. But at that point you can, uh, you can just... Uh, um Use JTAG. <laughs> <laughs> no, but you can send, uh, you, you can send uh, a bootloader update, so it will reset the number, right? So this is a bootloader update with the new, um, with the new firmware attached. Because you can't get a higher version. Uh, bootloader has a different version, so hopefully you won't run uh, out of bootloader updates. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting. It's I yeah, it's, it's normally it's not going to. Happen. It is okay, but if, if you if you think you're sending more than four billion updates, uh, yeah. I would suggest that uh, we had we had uh, uh, also a check on the timestamp, so we can use uh, twelve bytes for it. So. You should be okay for your lifetime, even if you <laughs> don't do anything else than updating your device for the rest. Uh. Well, I think you said we should disable bootloader updating. Yeah, exactly, exactly. But there is. How, how do you do that on, a, say, on a, I don't know, Cortex M3? It's it's a compiled time feature, right? So you said I want uh, some code to run in RAM, which means that you can send a, a bootloader update. Because the problem with the bootloader updating itself is that you can't run a bootloader while you're writing to the flash, right? So, because it will just confuse the, 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 the fetch mechanism of the, of the MPU. So some code needs to be moved to the RAM and from there you can, do the, you can run the, the, the update of the bootloader itself. But it's a feature that's optional, so you don't have to enable it. So compile time, when you define a project you decide, should my uh, bootloader be updatable? The standard says it shouldn't, uh, but I want to keep this for myself, maybe because Bruno will run out of the uh, <laughs> version <laughs> numbers, you know, so uh, we have to, to, uh, to prevent that. Or because uh, he will lose his private key and uh, probably gets compromised, so we want to a revocation mechanism uh, that, that doesn't require the whole... Uh, so this is the comp compilation flag of the bootloader. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it's, it's a feature of the bootloader that you can decide uh, to enable or disable. Is that what? Uh, if you remove power during the bootloader. Exactly. Yeah. It is not. Uh, it it is not uh, power power safe. Uh, power fail safe. But it should be an emergency procedure, right? Okay. So. Just ensure that there is someone looking at the power while the bootloader is updated. <laughs> Is it? No question, yeah? Uh, wha what about uh, if you use uh, the option where you store the update candidate on the external uh, SPI? Mm -hmm. SPI? Users could uh, decap it? Or sure, yeah, yeah. Right? Sure, yes. Okay. Um, this secure boot don't, doesn't protect you from uh, someone stealing your firmware. It protects you from uh, someone willing to load a firmware on a device you produce. For the other way around, you have to use different mechanism. Uh, with a customer, we used uh, on uh, an XP Kinetis K82. There is a fantastic feature. You have uh, this uh, quad SPI bus. You can attach an external SPI 
and it will run any encrypted AES encrypted firmware from there. You just need to, to supply the AES key to the secure element and it will just uh, read uh, the flash as it, as it was clear. But if you try to decap, you, you find the AES encrypted uh, uh, data there. Uh, of course, this is a hardware extension. So you can control those kind of features uh, by talking to the device uh, from the bootloader. Also, Trust Zone, for instance, is another one. But you, you cannot really perform these things in software because if I try to do encryption of the image in software, I need a way to decrypt it uh, in the fetcher and that's something that is in inside the MCU and I cannot do it. And even if I do uh, prefetch, uh, decode, uh, load in RAM, etc., that's still something uh, that you can uh, decap my chip, steal my key and use it to, to decrypt it. So you need a way to safely store the key in a key vault <laughs> somewhere in the secure element. So it's, it's a problem I can't solve for you in software encryption. Uh, because there is no secret on a microcontroller if you have enough money to decap the chip which is not a lot it's less and less so vendors are, are coming uh, to uh, to us in that direction so if you're looking for hardware encryption you should look for hardware vendors okay okay thank you thanks again thank you